Who is Tim Patzel? Achievements in life at this point is one, I'm still married. My kids like me. I've been running really fast the last few years. What would you identify as the main factors? I bought a wedding ring and I held on to it for three or four months. Communication, if you're not talking, things shut down. I never thought that. I really didn't think that my life was gonna amount to much. You can't teach someone character. In another life, I would have been. God, I'll do anything for you, but be a pastor. Calling comes from God and assignments come from people, and I had got those confused. Your country is about to have a very important presidential election. I call it my dark night of the soul. We are very happy to have this conversation with you today, and we'll start with introductions. If you were to introduce yourself, who is Tim Patzel? It's such an honor to be here with you today and uh, to be in the country of Ukraine is so meaningful, especially in this challenging time. Who am I? Who is Tim Petzl? I'm a disciple of Jesus, first and foremost. I'm a husband to my wife, Anna. We've been married 23 years. I'm a father to three great children, Ben, Joey, and Jane. Uh, I'm a sibling uh, to my four my brothers and sisters. I'm a, I'm a son of Steve and Carolyn. And after all those family connections, I would say that I'm vocationally, my job is, is I'm a pastor. You have such a large circle of influence, but who or what has had the greatest impact on you as a person? A lot of different people that have had huge impact from my parents, who um, I was so fortunate to be raised in a Christian home. And a lot of my story of faith is my parents' story of faith. They met Jesus later on in their lives, right before I was born. And so getting to experience a life, I've never not known the grace of Jesus. Uh, so that's a huge impact on my life. I think other people that have impacted me is friends, mentors, and coaches. Uh, friends, people who've just been and lived life with me uh, have been so meaningful in shaping of my character and who I am. Uh, mentors, people that I can learn from. Uh, many of my greatest mentors I've never met, but it's books that I've read. Um, even people who've, from ancient times of the scriptures, of, of learning from mentors. And then coaches has been really important for specific areas of growth and development to find somebody who has further along in a journey in a specific area and get some specific coaching around skill development, um, some things that I need to learn. All of those together have been some of the most influential. Uh, I think you can never underestimate the value of relationships and the value of connections of people speaking life into you, um, but also learning to ask good questions have probably been some of the most influential things in my life. From your parents' family, what special qualities or values have you brought into your own family and life? One of the things I think I most appreciated in how I was raised is it wasn't that we were religious, is that we were a worshiping family. We worship Jesus. And I saw my parents put their faith into action. Um, we did big, scary things for Jesus. I watched my dad at 30 plus years old with five kids leave his vocation as an educator and become an unpaid intern at a church and then plant a church with five kids and having no money but trusting Jesus. So that, that, that utter reliance on Jesus and having to trust Jesus, not because it's just a, a concept or an ideology, but it's the very essence of life is, is following and worshiping Jesus. And then a consistent pattern of worship, not just church attendance, is we, we as a family would gather and um, learn together, devotions, uh, have dinner, we'd read the scriptures together. So it was so formative to our lives that it became the air that we breathed was the journey of discipleship, even from young children. And for my wife and I, as we had our kids in those early years, I wanted to discipline them. And I remember the Lord began to show me and remind how I was raised that my job is not necessarily to discipline my kids, but to disciple them in the ways of Jesus. What do you consider your greatest achievement in life? Achievements in life at this point is one, I'm still married. My kids like me. Uh, even just be a few weeks ago, we all got to spend time together. We have two kids who are 20 and out of the house. Um, I think those are great accomplishments. I know many people whose 
wives don't like them and their kids don't want to be with them. And so to me, I think that's one of the biggest accomplishments is my, my wife still loves me, I hope, and my kids want to be with me. The midlife crisis in men, is it inevitable or can it be avoided? Natasha, do you think I'm middle-aged? Is that what you're asking me? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I am 46 years old. Uh, I would be a classic poster boy for a midlife crisis. And I, I think we can make through life in our maturation process. Sure, we're going to have multiple crises of identity, of all these things. Um, I think we can go through life without having major crises. And one of the things that my wife and I are trying to be very intentional about is that we're always planning for the next season. And I think that's what freaks people out and makes people go into crisis mode is they weren't planning for that next season. Um, especially if you're a family man or a father, so much of your time and energy goes to raising your kids. And we're at this season where we're launching our kids off into the world. And so a lot of times you don't know what to do because all your time and energy, emotional energy, everything was into raising the kids. And then all of a sudden the kids don't need you anymore. And I've learned this too, that what worked for the first 20 years of, my, of our marriage, all of a sudden my wife's like, mm, I'm not going to put up with that anymore. So things begin to really change. And so I think for men, especially it creates this crisis of who, who needs me, who respects me. And so I, we've all seen this, that guys kind of go off the rail. Um, but I've really tried to plan for that. So these are some of the things of having good mentors, like, hey, Tim, be prepared when your kids leave, you're gonna have to find new hobbies. So I've been working the last few years to find new hobbies, to do things that I always planned for, but sacrificed as a father to say, no, we can't afford that, we don't have the time for that. But now in the season, having time for that. So planning for each individual season and then, Anne and I, even in our marriage, we're preparing to be empty nesters for our kids are going to be gone. And so we're talking to people, we're getting coaching, we're getting wisdom on what that's going to be like. Because so many couples in America, this happens all the time, they raise their kids and then they look at each other and they go, I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. All we've done is the last 20 plus years is raise kids and they get divorced and they separate because they didn't plan at all for the next season. So I think we can avoid crises by being wise, planning, getting good coaching and wisdom from the generations ahead of us. I never thought that I'd be in Ukraine. My biggest challenge right now is. Oh man, I thought I had something. My main challenge is trying not to get old too fast. What would you say to your wife on your silver wedding anniversary? We made it. My greatest fear is that I would be perceived as not working hard enough or not stewarding my life well. Who would you never work with on a team? People who take themselves too seriously drive me crazy. In another life, I would have been probably entrepreneurial, business person. My heart right now is my heart right now is launching our children into the world. Your word for this year is pace. Uh, I've been running really fast the last few years and my word of the year 2024 is pace. I think of the scripture in Genesis where it says walked with God in the cool of the day. I feel like I've been running and it's time to walk with God. Thank you. Now let's talk about your ministry as a pastor. How did this decision come into your life? Is a calling from God necessary for a pastor? And how did it happen for you? As a young man, um, my dad was a pastor. And I remember some nights there were people at the house, I think it was the church leadership, were downstairs in our home and they were yelling at my father, disappointed he wasn't doing a good job, frustration. And I remember as a young boy laying in my bed saying, God, I'll do anything for you, but be a pastor. Yeah, this, this journey of calling and assignment, that's kind of the way I like to put it. Do we feel a sense of calling from God? I would say yes and no. Part of my story is I was a young uh, pastor in my early 20s. Anna and I had been married for three years and we were doing college ministry, working with university students. And we thought that was the course and trajectory of our lives. We loved it, saw great fruit. We saw God 
grow a small group of people to over 500 college students that were meeting on Friday nights and God was doing amazing things. Uh, young men and women were meeting Jesus. We, we thought that that was going to be our lives. And then one day I went into the office, the church we were working at, and the pastor said, I'm sorry, Tim, we have to let you go. Um, and I was fired. And it really derailed my life. I call it my dark night of the soul. Um, because I thought everything that I had hoped for, everything that I had dreamed, all the callings and hopes and ambitions that I had were gone like that in a moment. And, and we had just had our second child, so I didn't have a job. I didn't have a vocation. I didn't have a calling. I didn't have a purpose. It was, it was really scary for me. I remember uh, I didn't sleep for a long time <laughs> for, for several weeks just with all the anxiety and fear. And I remember I scared Anna because she was so concerned for me. It was so, such a dark time in my life. But God began to shape me through that darkness. And here, here's what he taught me, is that calling comes from God and assignments come from people. And I had got those confused. And my assignment was to be a college pastor. And that was taken away because of circumstances out of my control, change in leadership, financial situations. And, and so that was devastating to me. But what God began to shape through that dark time was a sense of calling. And what I kind of went through that process, here's what I came out on the other side. This is what my calling is. is I, I really believe that for my family, for me, our calling is to serve the local church. And so we, we've just done that for the last 25 years of our lives, whether it's traveling around the world, whether it's serving in our congregation. Now, my assignment at this season of my life is to serve at Stanwood Foursquare, which is one unique expression of the local church. But one day that will end. Either I'll get too old and I'll have to retire. Either I'll, um, the, cha the change of leadership could say, we, we want a different pastor. Um, I could make a mistake. I could fail morally. And those would be decisions that either myself or others would say, that's changing. But I hope and believe that when my assignment's done, I'll still fulfill my calling of being a guy who serves the local church. Which I want to ask you about the difficult moments in your ministry. The picture may not always be perfect, and you may not always be content with yourself. How do you handle such situations when things are tough and you don't achieve what you strive for? I think I've learned that either you're in a difficult season, you're coming out of a difficult season, or you're heading into a difficult season. I think Jesus even says this. He says, in this world, you'll have challenges, you'll have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And I think it can be dangerous for us as disciples of Jesus that often we think if I'm experiencing resistance, pain, sorrow, that something's wrong. I think that's just the nature of the broken world we live in often. And so even that mentality helps us to have more resilience and strength to go through difficult times versus just always feeling like, oh, woe is me. Everything's so challenging. Everything's so difficult. Different seasons, I think, require different things. Uh, the last several years with the global pandemic, COVID, with it, even in my country, with political upheaval, um, it has been a difficult season. I've had to learn new skills of a couple of things. Is one is resilience, is is learning that part of the nature of what Jesus has done in me and His Spirit. That if we really believe that the Spirit of God is in us, that it's not about how strong I am or how much I can accomplish or not accomplish, but it's that. The spirit of Jesus, the resurrection power of Jesus lives in me. And things will be hard, things will be difficult, but that power lives in me. And I can have the, the strength of God to be resilient, to bounce back. Um, I also have learned, especially over the last few years, that there's something so important about, I think, leaders, disciples, believers, always coming back to joy that somehow one of the characteristics that has defined the people of God for 2,000 plus years is this ability when life is hard, when circumstances are difficult, when you're in exile, is that our circumstances do not dictate how we feel. 
and we can be a people of God. I, I think even in the country of Ukraine, I, I hope I, I'm, I, I'm not a nation of war, but how do we have joy in the midst of pain and sorrow? How do we have this joy that Jesus promises us, that the Apostle Paul writes about in his suffering and his sorrow and his persecution? And there's just something of resilience and joy that I think can sustain us through difficult times. And then sometimes we need help. I think coaches, mentors, and friends have really been sustaining through difficult times as well. Thank you for sharing. In the biographies of many people of God, there was often a significant moment that radically changed them, transforming them from confident leaders into humble servants of God, described as people with a good pastoral and fatherly heart. We're talking about this brokenness. Was there such a moment in your life or not? For sure, I've been broken and restored many times. But, but even for me, I think uh, as a young boy, I was 10 years old, part of my story that I think so speaks to this. Uh, I had severe learning disabilities and um, was in special classes through the early years of my education. Uh, my, my little brother, younger brother, was super smart. He would go to the special uh, higher smart kids class and I would go to the kids class that needed special help. And so as a young boy, even in eight, seven, ten years old, I felt very stupid. I felt low self-worth. Um, I, I, I really didn't think that my life was going to amount to much. And at 10 years old, God kind of began a, a miracle in me. I met a teacher who helped me and I learned to read at 10 years old, which is really late in the process. And I had repeated multiple grades and, um, but God began to do a restorative work in me, even at a, a young age. So that's, that's sure a part of my story of, of just resilience and learning to figure out how to survive and be confident when we feel insecure, when we feel unintelligent, like we don't have the answers, that, that's a part of my story. But I think part of what shaped me has been maybe not big events or I got fired from a job at a church, but for me, it's been a lot of little being crushed and being restored. I think every season of life, there's these moments where we get to choose God's transformational work in us. And he loves me so much that sometimes he won't save me from the consequences of my actions. And so my lack of wisdom, my lack of maturity, um, I have to suffer those consequences and I have to learn and grow through that. And I think that's the nature of, of transformation, the nature of discipleship is that we, we take a step forward and we run into resistance, we run into difficulties. Sometimes we have to take a step back, we have to learn new skills, be humbled, learn to not rely on ourselves, but lear learn to rely on Jesus. I wish the, if for the life of a disciple that growth looked like, you start here and it's just up and to the right, it's just this linear line. But I, I, I think for all of us, my life too, is it's just much more all over the place. You, you, kind of grow flat and then you run into difficulties and God transforms you and you grow. Sometimes it's all these crazy journeys that lead us into different places. And that's often where people get distracted as a pastor and discipling people. When an, uh, you know, a curveball comes, something they didn't plan, either that's going to help you grow or it's going to derail your process. And as a leader, especially, I think you have to learn to say, there are things in my life that has to die. And then there are things that have to experience the resurrection power of Jesus. So that on the other side of that is something new and better than I could have ever even thought or hoped for. What are the biggest challenges Christian leaders in America are facing today? I think for the church in America, one of the challenges is cultural Christianity is dead. Cultural Christianity doesn't exist. And so a lot of people thought they were Christian just by the nature of they'd go to church on Christmas and Easter or they were born into a Christian home. And for the church in America, we have to understand that we're no longer um, living in Israel. We have to really think about ourselves as living in exile, like Babylon, like Daniel. And, 
if you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel had huge influence, but it wasn't from a place of power. It was from a place of of thinking and challenging the culture. Even as a young man, when he shows up in Babylon, he sets up a test and he's smart and he's thinking and he's watching and he's observing and he's saying, how do I fit myself into this culture? How do I have influence in the culture? And the danger I think for the church in the West, especially in America, is to sit around and say, all right, people come to us when you have problems and we'll tell you about Jesus. We have to have a different mentality and realize we're no longer the host. We're not the predominant worldview in America, but the gospel is a, is a, is, um, a smaller subset of people. And so we're no longer the host, we're the guests. And it has to change how we think about engaging culture how we engage in relationships, how we even think as a church to invite people in to preach the gospel and help people um, know about a God who loves them so dearly. What are the most important qualities you look for in people that you invite to your church leadership team? I think first and foremost in anybody who I want to serve alongside with is its character. Um, you can't teach someone character. You can learn skills. Uh, I've learned all kinds of skills, but, but character is so, so important. And the most challenging people I've worked with and the most difficult leadership things have been when people's character has failed. When they, there was, there was a part of their character that wasn't formed. Uh, so I want, I'm looking for people who have great character and then we can teach skills and people can learn along the way. What is the most challenging aspect of your leadership in ministry as a pastor, considering your personality type? So I think you figured this out about me from just our little interaction. I'm driven. I'm um, a little, uh, I don't take myself very seriously and I laugh at myself. Uh, and most pastors in my experience, take themselves very seriously and, uh, and part of even my gifting, my primary giftings are not shepherding or caring. My primary gifts are leadership and teaching. And I'm a little bit more of an entrepreneurial, uh, have an entrepreneurial bent in me. And so sometimes it's really confusing for people. They're like, I don't understand Tim. He's not kind. He's not loving. I've had to learn and develop that. But, but I like to say this kind of how I understand leadership in the church is it like a restaurant sometimes. If you've ever been to a really nice restaurant, you walk into the front of a restaurant and the maitre d' or the host will say, welcome, good evening, can we seat you? And it will be peaceful, there'll be nice music, all the waiters and waitresses, the servers, how, can I fill your water, can I help you? They give you the menu and they, the, the, you read the menu. Uh, and I think that's what often people think church leadership is like. Uh, when it's not a Sunday or not a service, the pastor's just, Oh, it's just me and Jesus. But in that same restaurant, in the kitchen, if you go into the kitchen, it's chaos. People are yelling, get the food out, the order here. We got to get the water. We got to get these things. We got to make it happen. Get the bread, make it happen. And I think church life is like that. A lot of times our public services are like the dining room of a kitchen, of a restaurant. But the reality of church leadership is back in the kitchen where we got to get things done. There's a deadline coming. We don't have time often to sit and make sure that everybody's okay and everyone's feeling well. We got stuff to do. And that's kind of the, the business, the event, the reality of ministry. And that can be shocking to people. And especially I'm a little bit more bent that way. So I've had to learn to chill out. I've had to learn to calm down, to be patient with people. Um, but to also recognize that I'm, I'm driven. And that is uncomfortable for a lot of people as a pastor to have someone who, who drives them, who holds them accountable. Those three things of efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability, um, that can be unsettling for some people. Like, well, isn't the gospel all about love and affirmation and care? Sure, but as a leader, we're responsible and God's given us a stewardship and we have to own that and we have to be held accountable to accomplish all that God has asked us to do. How did you know that Anna was the one? And after years of marriage, what do you value most about her? I had no idea she was the one. 
I bought a wedding ring and I held on to it for three or four months. And I kept saying, God, you have to tell me to marry this woman. We had dated for a year. We had broken up for a year. We had been dating for a couple of months. And I knew I needed either, as Beyonce would say, I need to put a ring on that thing. And uh, so I woke up one Saturday morning in my dorm room in college saying, God, you have to tell me if I should marry this woman. And I just remember God kind of whispering says, I'm not going to tell you to do it because when it gets hard, you'll blame me. So <laughs> yeah, I, this is what I felt. God said, do you want to marry her? And I said, Yes, I do. I love her. So before I left my dorm room that day, I called my parents and I said, Mom and Dad, I want to ask your blessing to ask Anna to marry me. Then I called her father and said, I want to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And we were engaged that Monday. And a few months later, we were married. What would you identify as the main factors that make your marriage successful? Communication. If you're not talking, things shut down. Empathy. I think learning to understand the other person's perspective and the way of life, that's been a journey for me. You think after 23, you know everything about this person, but you have to be empathetic. Think about how they see the world. And then I think uh, the Bible says what? Don't go down, don't go to bed with your anger and just learning to be quick to forgive. What is the most essential quality a pastor's wife must have without which success and impact in her role wouldn't be possible? I don't think there's one way for a pastor's wife. I think every pastor's wife has to be who they are, who they're uniquely created to be. One of the things one of my mentors taught me, he says, you teach your people in the church how they're going to treat you. And I think often people have expectations on the wife of the pastor that is unfair. And it's my job to protect and create an environment and a culture that is honoring and loving and only... Um, has no hidden agenda and lets, just like anybody else in the church, it's my job for the gifts to make room for themselves. So whatever my wife is good at, there's room for her to get involved, but not the expectation for her to be somebody she's not. What was the most challenging period of your parenting? And what is the most important lesson you learned that you are ready to share with others? I think every season of parenting is really challenging when they're young. It's different, challenging, it's tiring, it's exhausting. When they're younger, as they're maturing, it becomes challenging. And now that we've kind of in the teenage years, I think that's challenging in its own way. But I think for us, and I'm looking ahead, is recognizing that the longest season of parenting is adults when your kids are out of the home. It feels like it takes so long for your kids to grow up. But really the longest time of parenting is parenting adult children. And so as we're launching our kids into the world as they're in their 20s and graduating from high school and off to college and university, I think it's the most challenging because they don't want to hear what you have to say. And all you can do is you can be a coach and you can ask, answer questions that they ask, but they don't want your advice anymore. And uh, so one of our great mentors says, as a parent of adults, never miss the opportunity to shut your mouth. A pastor's family is often under the close watch of the congregation, which expects an ideal image that is nearly impossible to maintain in real life, especially when children become teenagers. Have you faced such challenges, and how did you address them? For our family, I think that's, we, we train our people how they're going to treat in the culture of our church. That's our responsibility as leaders. And so one is we, we talk about that our kids aren't perfect. Uh, Anna and I, we understood that our kids are sinners. They're wonderful. They're amazing. But what is Jeremiah says, the heart is evil and wicked. And so our kids are not better than anybody else's kids just because they're pastor's kids. And so we, um, we really want to try to create an environment where we're not shocked by the fact that our kids are not perfect. So when they choose righteousness, we're really excited about that. But we're not crushed when they exert their own free will. Our kids have free will. They have their own choices and they have to be responsible to God. That's what Ann and I ultimately have prayed every day of our lives for our kids' lives is that they would be accountable to God. What is the main piece of advice you give to young couples at their wedding? Be ready to have multiple marriages inside of a marriage. I think people get really stuck when they think that after they have kids, they'll be able to go on dates and be all romantic like they used to be. Kids change everything. So you're going to have a, a, a marriage before kids. You're going to have a marriage with young kids. You're going to have a marriage with 
older kids. And then when you're done raising your kids, it's just going to be the two of you. So make sure that you have invested in your relationship because when the kids are gone, you're going to have to discover who each other is and you're going to have to like each other because uh, my wife often says this, when it's all done, it's just going to be you and me. So you better make sure that we like each other. We understand that the church lives in very different times and periods. This raises a very important question. What should the church hold on to in order to remain faithful to the Bible while staying relevant? That was a great question, Natasha. And I think it's one of the most important things that the church in the 21st century faces. We're, <clears throat> we live in a global and pluralistic society where many ideas, many religions are accepted, maybe like never before. And so how do we as Jesus followers, as disciples, hold on to orthodox theology of, about key social issues, about sec our sexual identity, um, about morals and values? It's really challenging when we are moving more and more to a, a secular society. So I think we have to hold on to the things that are most important. I think of the story in the book of Exodus when God leads the people out of Israel, out of, excuse me, out of slavery in Egypt, and they're at Mount Sinai and Moses is up getting the commands. He's speaking with God and the people down below are impatient and they are frustrated and they're angry. And they go to Aaron, who's the guy who's second in command, and they say, Aaron, build us a golden calf. Build us a golden calf. And in probably one of the saddest leadership stories in all the scriptures, Aaron, who's supposed to be this great leader, he compromises and he builds, he gives the people what they want. He gives them a fake God, a fake gospel. It looks shiny. It looks good. The people can worship it. It makes them feel good. It, uh, it, it accomplishes, it appeases the crowd. And Moses comes down and God is so angry. And I think that's the danger we live in. Is This is what I've even seen. Some of my good friends are, are compromising and they're giving the world a golden calf version of, of the gospel that is really no gospel at all because it, it, it doesn't offend anybody. It somehow appeases the crowd. When Jesus and the apostle Paul talk about this, that the gospel is offensive. It is, it is not popular to say that there's one way to God. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, those are definitive statements in the gospel of John. And those are very unpopular right now in our world because it's non-tolerant. It seems what, what we perceive, that what the gospel says, what Jesus tells us is love, our world says is hate. What Jesus teaches us how to live, what the New Testament church had to figure out, our popular culture would say that's hateful. But yet the very essence of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is that we hold on to these truths and we have grace and truth, that we tell the truth, but yet we're also loving. I, I've heard it said that grace without truth is, is just not helpful, but truth without grace is just unkind. And we have to figure out how to live that out, to hold on to the truths of God, yet be loving in a world who says that if we hold on to anything and we say, no, or we have a moral standard that that's actually hateful, we can so easily create golden calves and just appease the people. And I think ultimately it will diminish the power of Jesus to change people's lives. The church is not only a community, but also an institution. This means that we build systems and structures, and it often happens that these heavy church structures can break people. Is this challenge unique to Ukraine or do similar issues occur in America as well? If so, what safeguards are in place to prevent this? The church is a unique thing. It is, it's an organization. There's a business component to it, 
But I think there's really a third way that Jesus invites us to, and what the New Testament tells us about, is the church is actually this living organism. Paul talks about it as the body. Um, so it's, it's living, it's dynamic, it changes. So I think a couple things, especially for church leaders, is you have to recognize and give space and energy and time to the structure of the church. Because if you just think, I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to love people. You'll get eaten alive by all the business, the organizational, the infrastructure sides of things. And even Jesus dealt with this. Jesus had two parts of his ministry. He had a mission and the mission he proclaims, he, he stands up and he reads from the prophet Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Uh, he has anointed me to proclaim good news, to set the captives free, to open the eyes of the blind, to declare the year of God's favor, that Jesus came to do good things. To f he fed the crowds. He cared for people's physical needs. But he also came with a message. So his mission was to do good, help people. But he came with a message, and the message was, repent for the kingdom of God is near. He called people into a new way of living. And for most church leaders, I think we spend all of our time, we get all of our training on the message of Jesus. We just think if I preach a great sermon, if I say, repent, because Jesus loves you, that everything will, will happen. But we, we have to understand that there's both the mission and the message. And if we just focus on the mission, then we just become an NGO, a non-government organization. We just hand food out. We just do good things, which is not bad, but that's not our primary mission. Or if we just uh, are a place that just says, repent for the kingdom of God is near, we just do the message. The beauty of the church and when we do it right is when we have those together, the mission and the message of Jesus together. Now, for a leader, that's really complicated. So a couple of things. I think Jesus even recruited a team. He had 12 disciples. He had some guys who were accountants, tax collectors. It even says, uh, uh, J Judas was actually the guy who was the bookkeeper of, of his ministry. And so Jesus even built a team of people to do both, to care for the mission and the message. And most pastors and leaders don't think about that. And we need to remember that part of how a church is going to function is we have to have systems in place. If you don't have systems in place, if you're not in charge of your systems, your systems will be in charge of you. We, we just have three principles, three values in our church is that we're efficient, we're effective, and we're accountable. And those three things are kind of safeguards and a matrix for us to make decisions um, to help us really move forward in both of those things. But there's been times, you're right, when um, just the ministry of the church, the infrastructure is overwhelming, when you don't make everybody happy when they don't like what you're doing. We just went through a building campaign. We built a new building as a church, which is good. The church has grown and we needed more physical space, but it is a lot of work to build a new building and it almost crushed me, but you have to build teams around you. And I think you got to be a little scrappy, a little entrepreneurial in a, in a, as a leader in the 21st century. Your church, what kind of people attended? We like to say we're a church that gets it done. Uh, we even kind of say it colloquially, get her done. Um, we, we really want to be action-oriented people. I think it's easy to sit and talk about Jesus, but, but they'll know you're my disciples by how you love each other. So I pray that we're a, a community of people who love each other deeply, but we also love our community and we put that love into action. Uh, so we do some crazy things like one Sunday a year, we call it Serve Our City. We take our worship to the streets and we partner with our city and parks and we take hundreds of people and we clean up the schools. We serve during the normal time that we would do our worship Sunday morning services. We engage people to serve our community and let the community know that we love them. Because the reality is most of the people in our community are not sitting around thinking about church. So we have to remind them that we're thinking about them. I often make people very uncomfortable in my church because I'll say this, that God hears your prayers just as much as he hears my prayers. And um, so we really want to empower people to be the ministers of Jesus. It's not just for the few. So our, our job, and then 
uh, Paul, the New Testament speaks a lot, especially in Ephesians. He says that the work of the pastor, the work of the leaders is to empower the people to do the work. And so we really want to have a church that is empowered with priests to do the work of Jesus. And then I always think of uh, in Exodus 18, when Jethro comes and sees Moses and Moses is trying to do everything for everybody and he's solving all the problems and nobody serves well, he's exhausted. The people are frustrated and his father-in-law Jethro says, what you're doing is not good. And he gives them a whole new model. And we kind of call that the inverted pyramid. It's easy to have a pyramid where the most important person is on top, but I think we want to have a, a pyramid that's upside down where the most people are, are on top and versus the pastor telling people what to do, that we empower people, we train people, we uh, equip people, our small group leaders to care for the people in their group. And if there's an issue that's too complicated, this is what Jethro said, then you take it to the next level and then you take it to the next level. So eventually the things that are most complicated will get to me, but care and um, leadership is much more facilitated when it's not revolved around one person, one individual. So we want to have a diversified, empowered congregation to serve people. And as a pastor, I think I am first among equals at best. So we, we try to really not have a honor culture where the leader is, I, I like to say this, leaders eat last. Sometimes in some churches, the leaders are the one who get all the benefit. They're the one who are honored. And I really think that as a servant and Jesus, the New Testament even say this is I'm a slave of Jesus. And so that means that I, I serve. Jesus came and laid his life down. So I think the role of a leader is to serve and lay their life down. And so with, with our leaders and with our staff, we always say we're going to eat last. And that means that we're going to care for others and then we'll care for ourselves. Your country is about to have a very important presidential election. Do you feel responsible for the decision your country and your congregation will make? And can you influence the formation of their values in this regard? Loaded question. That's not fair. Good question. I'll answer it though. Um, in my office above my desk, I have a note that says, God is in charge of who's in charge. And the early church dealt with this too, is there were ungodly leaders, the Roman emperor. And that was one of the things that defined the early church is they said, you got to bow your knee to emperor and say that the emperor is Lord. And they said, no, Jesus is our Lord. So especially in the United States, we have the freedom, we have the responsibility to vote. But one of the things as a disciple and as a pastor, I really lead our church in is I ask us that people have to vote their conscience. And one party in a two-party system like America, it's not one party is godly and one party is, party is ungodly. People would disagree with me on that. But our allegiance, my allegiance, and what I want to communicate to the people I'm called to serve and lead is that our allegiance is ultimately to Jesus. And, and that's where we're, our, our faith is going to inform our politics. And one of the challenges that we're facing right now in the United States and the church in America is many people, their politics are informing their faith. And that leads us to a place that nobody wins. And so whoever the president is going to be, I know for even like the country of Ukraine, um, that has huge impact. And I think there is a responsibility as America that God has put us in a unique place to be a blessing to the world around us. Even the nation of Israel, God says, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And I think in some ways that's a responsibility when God blesses you to bless other people. Um, so luckily in our party system, I think presidents and people outside of the United States think that presidents have much more power than they do. <laughs> we have a, a, a three branch system, which presidents can talk a lot, but it's hard to actually do those things sometimes. So, um, I trust God in the midst of it. And I say, here's what I tell my church. You need to vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote but you need to vote. And that is the most important thing. As Christians, we need to be responsible citizens. We need to be participants. And I think it's easy to sit on the sidelines and complain, but you have a voice, you have a vote, and that means you need to participate in the system.
Pastor Tim, you are currently visiting our country. How many countries have you traveled to before this? Oh boy, I, <laughs> I've uh, had the privilege to travel quite a bit. I think probably between 15 and 20 countries. The one continent, the two continents I haven't been to are Africa and Antarctica. I, I, I hope to get to Africa. I'm not sure I'll uh, be a missionary to the penguins in Antarctica, but Africa is on my goal. Um, but yes, it's been fun to travel around the world and see many different countries. Coming to a country at war and bringing your 16-year-old daughter with you is a very brave decision. How was this decision made? When we just decided to come, I just kind of knew that our daughter needed to come with us. And um, you probably should ask my wife, <laughs> Anna, more about that than me. Um, but what I think this comes back to really our goal of discipling our children is this will be, she'll remember this for the rest of her life. And one of the things that I've prayed <clears throat> for my kids every day, it, it'll, in a world where so many people are fearful and scared, that I want the, the life and the power of Jesus to be in them where they're, they're, they are fearless. And um, you've got to meet my daughter, and I think you'd see that. She's, she's fearless. And our boys, I think, are the same way. Our son just got back from uh, a trip in Switzerland and Brazil doing ministry. Uh, our oldest son is doing eight weeks of summer camp fearlessly. You, you ran summer camp. That's exhausting. And so we, we've just prayed and we've instilled that we're going to be, if we're going to follow Jesus, we're really going to do it. And that means that we're going to sacrifice and we're going to go places where the gospel demands. Jesus always tells us to be consumed with the other. And um, so we had an opportunity to go. And I think a big reason we came was, Natasha, your daughter, Yulia, we trust her and she is passionate about her homeland. And when someone is passionate about something, it's contagious. And so we could not go because Yulia is passionate about that and she shared this vision with us the last two years and so when we sat in my office and started talking about this dreaming about it uh we said let's go let's do it and then we're here it's hard to believe but i, I just think it's the it's the hand of god it's um a church that is behind us because it takes a lot of money and resources to make this happen but we, we just know it's the right time at the right season to be here to support and partner with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are truly grateful, and not just as a family. On behalf of the entire Ukrainian people, we want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We have survived, we're not yet defeated, and we are trying to overcome the aggressor country thanks to your prayers and support. We couldn't have done it alone. So a sincere thank you in your church. My question is, what were your expectations and what was the reality you encountered here? I didn't think it'd be this hot uh, in Ukraine. I think I thought of like the great former Soviet Union, cold Siberia type situation. Um, it's very much like the Midwest of the United States, a beautiful country. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if I had a lot of expectations, but... It's, it's more than I hope for, a very kind and generous people. I've never met a people in all my travels who are more proud of their food than Ukrainians. You guys are really, really proud of your food. Uh, so that's, that's been fun. We've eaten very well. Um, and seeing joy and life in a community and the ministry of Jesus, even in the time of war, has been beautiful to see um, even a church that today, during, during this interview, there's a kids camp going on. Mm -hmm. And when it would be, let's pull back, let's protect ourselves, let's try to think, is I think the church, there's, a, there's a, a leader in our church, he once told me this, he says, Tim, it's kind of funny, every time things are bad in the culture, our church does really well. And every time uh, things are good in the culture, our church doesn't do really well. And I think in crisis, that's when the gospel has flourished and the church has always had its biggest impact throughout history 
on the edges of society when things aren't good. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I, I think it's a great opportunity. We believe and we have hope in a hopeless time. And that's the hope and the power of Jesus. So it's been fun to partner and, and see your ministry, to see the church, to see what God's done, even in the midst of a difficult time. For us, the issue of injustice in this war is very painful. When Ukraine gave up its nuclear potential, we were promised protection and security, including from the United States. On the one hand, we are very grateful to America for leading the consolidation of aid for Ukraine. On the other hand, we see significant delays in providing this aid, and every day of delay means hundreds of new deaths, our soldiers, their families, new widows, and new orphans. We are wondering how we can change this situation. How can the world change the situation? How can we influence the civilized world to help us win? I, I can only answer that question in two ways. One is as a citizen of the United States, and the other one I think that would inform me as a disciple. Th those would be the two things. But, you know, geopolitics is very complicated. And even our own nation's history is rooted of standing up against a great power that it seemed like there was no hope that we would ever get our freedom and independence from. You know, at that point, England was a massive empire and the chances of seemed like America even becoming an independent, free country seemed very small. And I think it probably feels a little bit like that for Ukraine, a nation of relatively small, 32, 38 million people compared to Russia, a massive nation. I, I think the danger for all of us is, especially when Jesus talks about the story of the Good Samaritan, he asks this question, he says, who was the neighbor? And so as a disciple of Jesus, I think we always have to remember that our neighbors are not just the person who's next to us, but every human being, every seven, almost eight billion people on the planet, we're called to care for and love. And it can feel overwhelming. Um, and even for us in our church, we, we've chosen to be involved here because we have a personal connection through relationships with people. There's other wars going on that the United States is very involved in, in Israel and Hamas and other places around the world. And those are things that I don't want to even pretend to understand all the complexities of that. But I think I come, I come humbly and I come with, I think, a bigger awareness in this trip of understanding that it's easy to watch the news it's easy to watch human suffering and think that that's really far away and it's distant. But I think what Jesus has done in me and what he requires his disciples to do is to remember that everyone's our neighbor. Whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Israel, whether it's nations all around the world that are dealing with violence and evil and unjust situations and unjust leaderships and governments. It's really challenging, and I think it requires great wisdom. It requires great humility. And here's, here's, here's what I know I'm going to do after being with the Ukrainian people, and my heart is now here. I'm going to be on my knees praying now more. I, I don't know if I have influence to change geopolitics, but I know this. I know that when I pray, God hears my prayers. And I think that's where I ultimately put my hope is not in an army, not in a political system, but my hope is in God and his kingdom, which is coming and we can put our hope and trust in one day, Jesus will make all things right and all injustice will be, will, will be paid for and, and righteousness and God will eventually win in the end. That's a very difficult question. What would be the most important thing you'd like to tell Ukrainians at this moment? The word I'd leave for Ukraine is to don't give up, keep fighting, don't be discouraged. I know you're tired, um, but keep fighting. Don't give up. 